Good morning. Good morning. Today is on the calendar the day that we recognize Reformation Sunday. And as I was reading and thinking about today being Reformation Sunday, one of the one of the seminary professors that I that I like to read commentaries and stuff on said that, you know, this isn't a day that we just bash other churches or that we do a lot of things. He says, so this today is either Reformation Sunday or the 27th or something, Sunday of Pentecost, whichever, and there are alternate texts that day. And but it's, I don't know, it's been one of those things for me. I've always, always thought that on Reformation Sunday we should remember that that there is always reforming that needs to be going on. Maybe not so much in a church, but within ourselves. And those are some of the things that the texts talk about that we need to remind ourselves that you know we constantly need to be reformed to to God's way and to God's will. So without more than that, uh, our opening hymn is number 770, I Was There to Hear Your Morning Cry. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in times of trial. Defend them against all enemies of the gospel. And bestow on the church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. 
On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. On this day, uh, I chose that we would read the psalm as well as the other lessons on Reformation Sunday, partly because I really like Psalm 46. It's got a good message and good words, but our first reading is from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. And uh, these are words from God reminding the people um, of something new that God will do. The time is coming, coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and I will write it upon their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer shall a man teach his neighbor or a man say to his brother, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. This ends our first reading. And as I said, we're going to look at Psalm 46 today. It's, uh, it's on page 885, as your bulletin tells you, and just a good reminder of who God is. God is our refuge and our strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, and though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the most holy high place where God the most high dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. Nations are in an uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolations that he has brought upon the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in all the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Here ends the reading of our psalm. Our second reading is from the book of Romans chapter 3, um, verses 19 through 28. And Paul writes here of, of our righteousness and that it comes through faith, not through our acts, but through faith and trust in God. He writes, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world might be held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. But now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through Jesus Christ to, whom, to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we are all justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in His blood. He did this to demonstrate His justice, because in His forbearance He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate His justice at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. On what principle? On that of observing the law? No, but on faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. 
Here ends our second reading. And I invite you to stand as we read our gospel from John chapter 8, verses 31 through 36. Jesus is speaking to the Jews, to some of the believers that have been gathered around him. And he says, to the Jews who had been believing in him, Jesus said, if you hold on to my teaching, you are really my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are descend Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say we will be made free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. And we sing hymn number 741, Thy Holy Wings. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. As I mentioned before, I read the gospel that Jesus was speaking to the believers, and that's what you know. The first part of what we, what I read, was is what uh, Jesus said to his disciples. You got to find it in this Bible. You know, he, he said that he said this. Uh, John writes, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him. So he wasn't speaking to the Pharisees or to the scribes. He wasn't speaking to people that didn't know him. Jesus was speaking to his disciples, to the people that were following him. And he had people other than his disciples that were following and listening to his words each day and all the time. So he was speaking directly to them. And he said, if you believe in me, you'll be set free. And I thought about this, this word free and freedom. In the United States of America, we, we trust that we are free. We're free to do a lot of things. We're free to do the work we want to do and we can go to worship as we choose. We can, we can do a lot of things. We have freedom. But then I thought about how many things are we not free from? How many things are slaving us, enslaving us? What, what are we... What is it that, that we just can't get away from? 
And I thought sometimes, you know, we might be slaves to our job. We might be slaves to our house or our car or our, you know, who we are. You know, we might, we might be uh, so we're taken up in who we are that we can't do anything else. And as I was thinking about, you know, uh, having to put on a good face and, you know, making sure that everybody knew every, all of the good things about us, I was reminded of a story of a, a man and his wife that had new neighbors. And the man says, well, let's go meet the new neighbors. And so she went in and she took a bath and she put on her makeup and her lipstick and she fixed her hair and she painted her nails. and. He said, what are you doing? And she, and, and she said, well, I want him to see the real me. And we, and, and that's not just to pick on women, because, you, know, you know, guys, we do that too. You know, but, you know, sometimes some of the things that we think that, you know, this is who we need to be, or this is, you know, we got to put on this face for people. You know, those things kind of, you know, they enslave us. You know, we're, we're not just free to come and go. And... And I thought about, you know, people that play the organ for church on Sunday morning. You know, they're not just free to take off and go any place and all the time, although they, they leave us in, you know, part of the winter time. <laughs> and, 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 as a, and as a pastor, uh, you know, people will ask me sometimes, not so much here, but other places, you know, you get a long weekend, like Labor Day weekend, where are you going for the long holiday, Pastor? Well, I'll be staying here, I'll be preaching on Sunday. Oh, yeah, right. You know, but, you know, there are so many things in our lives that, that we have to do, or that, you know, we're required to do. It's, it's you know, how many, how many of you women enjoy meal preparation? <laughs> yeah, right. You know, and as guys, we don't think about that too much. You know, we just kind of, we're just kind of, you know, I had, I had one person not so long ago say to me that, well, you know, my wife likes to have, have our noon meal, you know, about noon. So I like to be, be there promptly for it, you know, because she puts in a lot of work to that, you know. And so, so here he's feeling that, you know, he's not quite free to come in at a quarter after 12, but because, you know, but you know, there are so many little things that, you know, that we schedule ourselves for. And that doesn't completely take away our freedom. But, you know, we think about being free as, you know, we can do whatever we want, whenever we want. But, you know, we really find out that we can't. And I know that there are some of you that have grandkids and great-grandkids that play sports. Or we had kids that played sports. And, you know, you're you're watching the clock, so I've got to hurry up and get going to here, you know, get going to there. You know, our, our days are scheduled a lot more than we think sometimes. And, you know, many, many times when, when we retire, we find that, you know, our freedoms aren't quite what we thought they would be either. But, you know, when you're working a full-time job, you aren't just free to come and go anytime and all the time. We have many restrictions on what we do and where we go and, and how, we, how we live our lives. <clears throat> and these disciples that Jesus was talking about, these faithful ones who who believed in Jesus as Lord and Savior. When Jesus said, if you believe in me, you'll be set free. They look at Jesus like he's crazy and they say, well, we've never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean set us free? Seems like they conveniently forgot that God had led them out of captivity in Egypt, that they had been captured and, and were enslaved by the Assyrians. And at, at the present time, the Romans were, were governing them and they didn't have so much freedom to do as they thought they did. But they didn't understand that Jesus was talking about the freedom from sin. And that's one of the things that, I mean, we can't, we can't justify ourselves according to, our, uh, according to God for our sins. And it was just like the, the, the Pharisee that prayed and talked about being righteous. And the tax collector who said, I'm a sinner. And Jesus said, the tax collector went away justified. It's when we come to God and, and accept the fact that we can't save ourselves, that there's nothing that we can do that we can live perfectly by the law. I mean, how many of you have sinned today? You know, I mean, we might not be 100% conscious of it, but our thoughts are something in us hasn't been pure. We are born with this condition that we will sin. And some days might be better than others, but 
yet you know, we never get through a day that we can say we have lived perfectly. We can't justify everything we do. Sometimes we try to justify things, well, but he did worse than I did, you know, and, and things that way. But we cannot totally justify ourselves. We cannot forgive our sins. We can't, we can't live this life of perfection. And so Jesus is saying, unless you accept me, Jesus Christ, and you accept the sacrifice that I am going to make for you, you cannot be free from your sins. You can't have this perfect relationship with God. You can't be righteous. You can't be justified. You can't be what God would have you be. And I think about, about that freedom. And I, I relate that a little bit to, to one of the reasons I wanted to read Psalm 46 today was I love verse 10. Um, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted on all the nations. I will be exalted in all the earth. But to be still... And to know that God is who God is. That he is the loving, gracious God who sent his son Jesus into this world to forgive us, to lead us, to show us the right way to live. To be still is so hard. It's so hard. Sometimes out in my wood shop, when I get a bunch of stuff glued up and I got all my clamps used or I just, you know, decide that I'm going to sit for a little bit, I just sit there sometimes. And I think about stuff. Sometimes I take my phone out and I read part of the Bible readings or I do different things that way. But I do try to take time just to be still and to think about God and to think about who God is and what God has done. And within that simple verse of be still and know that I am God, we just look at those words, you know, when we think about that, to know that God is God is such an important thing for our lives. To know that it is because of God that we are who we are. It is because of God that we are forgiven. It is because of God that we can hold our heads high as we walk through this life knowing that even though we're sinners, even though we go to worship on a regular basis, even though we aren't perfect, we come to God asking for that grace and forgiveness, knowing that we can't do it on our own. We take that time to recognize that God is, that he is there for us. And in the reading from Romans today, it talks about we are righteous because of our faith. And it's that simple, simple, what a word, simple trust in God. How hard is it to trust in God? How hard is it to really truly believe that when we come and ask for forgiveness, we're forgiven? I shared with you before that I had a gentleman not so awfully long before he died ask me, does God really forgive my sins? The answer is yes, he does. Because I, I mean, I asked him, well, do you believe God forgives my sins? Well, of course he does. He's, you're a pastor, he said. I said, that's got nothing to do with it. But that simple, I believe, is so hard for so many. I believe. I wonder, I question it to believe and to know that I'm set free from my sins, to know and to believe and to trust. Faith isn't a simple thing. But one of the things that helps me to be able to trust that God forgives my sins is that I know that when I did things that my dad and my mom didn't like, or that didn't approve of, that when I confessed to them, when I asked forgiveness, that they forgave me. And I know the same thing for my son and my daughter. That they did things sometimes that I wasn't 100% proud of or happy with. And yet because of my love, because of God's love, I was able to forgive and able to just you know, go on with life the way it is. And knowing how I can act as an adult and how my parents acted toward me and other people treat me as well. I get a glimpse of the graciousness of God. I get a glimpse of God's ability to forgive continually. I get a glimpse of, of how much God loves me and you. So Jesus says, those who believe in me have been set free. We 
trust that Jesus died on the cross for you and for me. Jesus' death, that's not what we celebrate. That's not what we recognize. Jesus' resurrection. Jesus' resurrection is what leads us to faith and to trust and to believe that God forgives us our sins. Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood given and shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. And in that act, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we see life, we see grace, and we see that we are indeed set free. Amen. Our offering plate remains in the entryway of the church. We sing our offering response. We give thee but thy prayer concerns this morning as we come to God with our prayers. I saw that and I wondered, I remember growing up that dad guys bottle gas, I, I thought that was Bender, so it, but it was Bedner. You know, I always said that name wrong all these years of my life. You know, and so I wondered what I saw. You know, Kyle Bedner, if I had been mistaken on, on that all these all these years. And so now I know. I've been wrong. Oh, <laughs> Cheryl's just nodding her head. <laughs> so, since we've all been wrong, let's bow our heads and pray. Gracious and eternal God, we give you thanks for this country, the United States of America. And we ask that you would bless our leaders. And as we have an election upcoming, that so many people are saying, I will do better than so-and-so, and so-and-so -so has done this wrong and that wrong. Help us to elect people to our House of Representatives and our Senate and to different places of, of authority in our land. Help us elect people that will uphold those jobs to the very best of their abilities, that they will look to the needs of the people of their constituents, that they will be filled with grace, that they will try to work together. Bless our election, help it to be as fair as it can be, and help us, help us to accept the results of the election as well. We give you thanks for our medical profession. And we know that there are so many that need, that need healing. So many more than just those that we pray for. So many more that we know than we list in our daily prayers. We ask Lord God that you would extend your gracious hand of healing through the doctors and nurses and, and through all who work in the healthcare profession. We ask your special protection and blessing and healing today again to be with Sue and Nancy and Nolan and Dean and Jim and Shirley, Steve, Terry, and Lyle, and these that we mention to you in the silence of our hearts. I pray for our teachers, Lord, within our school systems, from kindergarten to college to, to those who are teaching in the doctorates and you know the extended positions of life. Help our teachers and students to work together to promote um, a place of learning so that the, the minds of our youth are challenged and that new ideas and new inventions that will be blessings for our nation and for our world will come 
through this educational process. Help our students' minds to be attuned and to be excited about school. And to be excited about school, it needs to be made so that they can understand. So bless our teachers with the ability to teach in a manner that our students can understand and listen and learn and flourish. We pray for those today, Lord, who mourn the death of a loved one. We pray for the family of Kyle Bedner, that they would know your love and your grace, that they would know that their loved one continues to live with you in that place that we call heaven, a place that Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. And as we heard today, that when we believe and when we have faith in Jesus, we are set free. So for all who have left this life, who have been freed from, the, from all of the restraints of this earth, help them to live and to enjoy the glory that is given to them in Jesus Christ. We pray all of this. So we pray for our farmers, Lord. Many of them are wrapping up the harvest, but there are many that still have corn and maybe some beans and different things to do, bales to haul, cattle to feed, cattle to bring home, cattle to work, sheep and hogs that, that need care. The life of a farmer doesn't, doesn't ever come to just an end, just like the lives of so many. There's always something more to do. So bless our farmers, keep them safe as they prepare food and, and enough to provide nourishment for a nation. We pray all of this in the name of our Lord Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. On this day and always, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 776, Be Thou My Vision. Be Thou My Vision.